Unfortunately in life, not everything is rainbows and butterflies. And Met fans should know this better than anybody. After the 1986 World Series, the city erupted. The Mets were the hottest team in the sports world. They were the toast of the town. For once, the Yankees were little brother. They had taken a backseat to the Mets. And it seemed as if it would last forever. But it was way too short-lived. The Mets had the most talented team in baseball. And their most talented players had not even reached their prime. Doc and Darrell were surely headed to the Hall of Fame. Doc had a golden arm. Darrell was a 5-2 player. It was going to be the Mets version of Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle. They had their great veterans coming back, Keith Hernandez and Gary Carter. They had young, talented players who had barely even played yet at the big league level. The center fielder, Lenny Dykstra, who would come on in 87. Howard Johnson, Hojo, who would have several 30-30 seasons. They had a great young manager in Davey Johnson that the team loved playing for. They had just won 108 games and were the world champions. It seemed as if it would last forever. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Now before we jump ahead to the 87 season, we're going to go back to 84. 84 was the year where the franchise had really started to turn the corner. The team's electric duo of Doc and Darrell were both up with the big club. Darrell was fresh off his Rookie of the Year campaign and would continue to thrive in 84 as he built 27 home runs in his sophomore season. But more importantly, the rookie phenom, Dwight Gooden, better known as Doc, would burst onto the scene. He pitched to a 17-9 record in his rookie year with 276 strikeouts and a war above 9, which is still to this day the highest war for a rookie in the history of baseball. It looked as if the Mets had found their next Tom Seaver. And in 85, Doc would follow it up that year with perhaps the greatest year by a pitcher in the history of baseball. In 85, Doc was simply unhittable. He went 24-4 with a 1.53 ERA and had 268 Ks. He'd win the Triple Crown for a pitcher and he'd win the Cy Young that year in what seemed to be, surely, many more to come. And in 86, they'd go on to win the World Series. Got him. It was a fairy tale start to both Doc and Darrell's careers. They seemed immortal, but sadly, drugs got in the way. While the 86 Mets and their fans were celebrating this historic victory over the Red Sox at the team's parade, there was one Met missing. Their best player, Doc Gooden. Doc had spent the night in a crack house and didn't wake up in time to celebrate with his teammates. This was a sign of things to come. A month later in December of 86, Gooden was arrested in Tampa, Florida for starting a, some kind of riot. And rumors started to circulate about his potential drug abuse. Well, about a month before the 87 season, a very important year, might I add, a year in which the Mets were trying to defend their World Series crown, Doc Gooden tested positive for cocaine substance abuse. He was forced to go into rehab and missed a third of the season. Gooden would continue to pitch well, but never how he did in the 85 season. He'd still win 15 games that year, but the Mets failed to make the playoffs. They went 92-70. and 70. And much like Gooden, Strawberry had his own battles with drug abuse. Strawberry still was able to play at an all-star performance. He made an all-star game every year of his Mets career. But neither player was what they could have been. They were shooting stars, but they didn't have the longevity. They could have been all-time greats. They were bitter disappointments. After missing the playoffs in 1987, the 88 Mets would bounce back and win the division. They'd win 100 games that year, due in large part to stellar pitching performances from Gooden, Ron Darling, and David Cohn. 
as well as great offensive years from Kevin McReynolds, Daryl Strawberry, and Howard Johnson. Strawberry and McReynolds placed second and third in the MVP race that year as they lost to the Dodger, Kirk Gibson. The Mets played the Dodgers in the National League Championship Series in 88, in a season where the Mets beat them 10 out of 11 times in the regular season. But unfortunately for the Mets, the Dodgers, led by Orel Hershiser, continued their Cinderella story season by beating the Mets in seven games. And just like that, it was up in smoke. A team that all Mets fans thought would be a dynasty. A team that everyone in baseball thought would rival some of the great Yankee teams of old was done. The dream was over. The Mets would not be back to the playoffs for a decade. And by 1990, the Mets dynamic duo of Doc and Darrell would play their last game. Strawberry would bolt to the Dodgers after the 90 season. That's right, the same team that left New York. Gooden stuck around with the Mets until 1995, until he would leave for the Yankees. And from 1991 to 1996, the Mets boasted the worst record in all of baseball. The New York Mets made a crucial mistake after the Doc and Darryl era, and they took shortcuts. They tried to build the club via free agency by signing high-profile players such as Eddie Murray to a $3 million contract, Bobby Bonilla for over $6 million a year. They also traded McReynolds and Jeffries for one-time World Series hero Brett Saberhagen and his $3 million contract. The rebuilding was supported by the slogan, Hardball is back. And that couldn't have been further from the truth. They ended up trading Cone in the 92 season to the Blue Jays for Ryan Thompson and Jeff Kent. Well, Cone would help the Blue Jays win a World Series, and the Mets would get rid of Kent a few years later. He would later win an MVP with the San Francisco Giants. And don't even get me started with Bobby Bonilla. He's a legend in baseball. Not for anything good when it came to the New York Mets. The Mets signed a stupid contract and they still pay Bobby Bonilla to this day. Just over a million dollars every July 1st. He hasn't played for the Mets in 20 years. In 96, the Mets had two standouts. But it didn't result in too many W's in the win column. Lance Johnson had an unbelievable year that year, made the All-Star game. And Todd Hunley broke the catcher's record for most home runs ever in a season with 41. By the end of the 96 season, for the last 31 games, the Mets had promoted AAA manager Bobby Valentine to lead the club, and he would go on to have great success. In 97, they made a key acquisition. They brought in John Olerud, who was an unbelievable all-around first baseman, a stud with the glove and the bat. In 98, he batted 354 and finished 12th in the MVP vote. 98 was a huge year for the Mets. It was a year in which they were finally starting to turn the corner. They had acquired Al Leiter in the offseason, who would be a stud for the Mets, one of their best pitchers of all time. In his first year for the Mets in 1998, he pitched to the tune of a 17-9 record with a 2.54 ERA. He would go on to lead the staff until about 2003. Edgardo Alfonso was coming into his own as he would later shift to second base, but we'll get to that in 99. Ray Ardonia's had a great glove at short, but they needed one more big stick. And for that, they would turn to the Marlins. The Florida Marlins had just required one of the biggest rock stars in the sport, the greatest hitting catcher in the history of baseball from the LA Dodgers. And three days after acquiring him, they turned to the New York Mets, a deal in which the Mets gave up Preston Wilson, who of course was the son of Mookie. And it is the greatest trade in the history of the Mets. Piazza was the face of the franchise, the man that the Mets needed to lead the team going forward. And from that point forward, the Mets went from a laughing stock to one of the biggest forces in the sport. Just a year before, Mike Piazza had hit 362 with the Dodgers with 40 home runs and 124 RBIs, numbers unheard of from a catcher. He was second for the MVP award, award in which he placed second the year before. He was the best right-handed hitter in baseball at the time of the trade, and he would bring that to the Mets. Later in his career, he would make the Hall of Fame, and he would be just the second Mets player ever inducted into Cooperstown. Piazza brought hope. He brought a spark to the Mets. They would just miss the playoffs in 98 narrowly, which would set up the 99 season. 
Now, before the 99 season started, Piazza was a free agent. The Mets had to sign him, and they did. They also brought in another key part to the 99 team, and that was third baseman Robin Ventura. Robin Ventura that year would have an unbelievable year, and he would be in contention for the MVP award. He had an unbelievable bat, but even more importantly, he was one of, if not the, best defensive third baseman in baseball which forced the Mets to shift Edgardo Alfonso, better known as Fonzie by Mets fans, to second base. A year in which Alfonso would have a near MVP season. Together, they would make up half of what was the best defensive infield in the history of baseball. With Ventura at third, Ordonez at short, Fonzie at second, and Olerud at first, they were near perfect defensively. Boy, did he do it to Kim and Eddie. Oh, up the middle, still a chance for Ordonez. Oh, oh. at first base. What do we think of next? What a play by Ray Ordonez. Cookie Rojas says he's the best shortstop he has ever seen, and the fans here at Shea Stadium agree. But Leiter jamming Odago, falls it up the middle, gets past Leiter, and look at Ordonez cut it off. And in the outfield, their leadoff man was Ricky Henderson, the greatest leadoff man who's ever lived. Of course, he was a veteran at this point, but he enjoyed a nice bounce-back season in 99. And they had young emerging star Roger Cedeno, who would go on to steal over 60 bases that year. Everything was breaking right for the Mets in 99, and it led them straight to a one-game playoff for the National League wildcard for a chance to play in the playoffs for the first time since the 1988 season as they took on the Cincinnati Reds. They would go on to win that one game playoff against the Reds as Edgardo Alfonso would hit two home runs and they'd take on the Arizona Diamondbacks in the National League Division Series in a best three out of five. Well, the series would go five and it would have a dramatic ending. As long as, oh, that's hit well to center field. Finley goes back. It was magical. Todd Pratt, who was not even in baseball the year before, would send the Mets to the National League Championship Series, and they were four wins away from going to the championship as they would take on the hated rivals, the Atlanta Braves, a team that just had the Mets numbered throughout the 90s. I mean, they ruled the National League East. They made the playoffs every year, and they had great pitchers like Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin. And the Mets would fall down in the series three games to zero. But the Mets showed fight. They fought back. They would take game four. And that would bring us to game five. In what is one of the most memorable moments in Met history. The Grand Slam single. How about this? Two nights in a row, the Braves were so close to going to the World Series. 2-1 delivery. Robin! Unfortunately for the Mets, they would go on to lose Game 6 in Atlanta as Kenny Rogers would walk in the winning run in extra innings. But the team showed hope. They showed promise. They had a few holes they needed to fill for the 2000 season. They certainly could use another arm. And that's exactly what they did. They went out and they acquired Mike Hampton, who would be the team's ace for the 2000 season. As him and Al Leiter would form quite the one-two punch. The Mets would make some other key additions that year. They'd add veteran journeyman Todd Zeal to play first base as John Olerud left via free agency. They'd have a young emerging rookie who would finish third in Rookie of the Year voting that year in Jay Payton. They also added number 50, Benny Agbayani from Hawaii, who was a fan favorite. Hampton would start out slow that year. He'd lose his first five decisions, but he'd bounce back beautifully as he'd finished the year 15 and 10. It was a magical year for the Mets, as they'd go on to win the wild card and head back to the playoffs for a second straight year. The Mets would take on one of the greatest players who ever lived, Barry Bonds, and that year's MVP, Jeff Kent, in the first round of the playoffs. 
They'd lose game one in San Francisco and have their backs up against the wall in game two in a game that went to extra innings as John Franco would strike out Barry Bonds looking to send it back to New York as they were all squared up at one apiece. In game three, it would go to 13 innings and Benny Agbayani would have one of the most memorable moments in Met playoff history. Game four was a masterpiece, a game in which I attended. Bobby Jones would throw a complete game one hitter as the Mets would take down the Giants and head back to the National League Championship Series for the second straight year. Mike Piazza and the Mets would make quick work of the Cardinals as they would sweep them four games straight and send themselves back to the World Series for the first time in 1986 to take on the New York Yankees. It was an historic World Series, the first Subway Series in the history of baseball between the Mets and Yankees. One that we hope is not the last. Unfortunately for the Mets, they would fail to take home their third crown that year as the Yankees would win the series four games to one and Derek Jeter would win World Series MVP. Us Met fans would hope the Mets would come back hungry in 2001. Unfortunately, it was not a season that was meant to be. Things just didn't break right for the club that year. But there was one very memorable moment. One moment that came after the biggest tragedy in perhaps the history of America. 9-11. I remember that day like it was yesterday. Sitting in my 10th grade classroom, waiting for the bell to ring as I found out the terrible tragedy of 9-11, the planes crashing into the Twin Towers. Baseball was suspended for 10 days after the event, and the Mets were to be the first team to play since the terrible tragedy of 9-11. And the people of New York needed some inspiration. They needed some hope. And who else better to provide it to them than Mike Piazza? Met fans are getting into it now. You can hear the Let's Go Met crash. It's amazing when you're in the right place at the right time and you believe in yourself and you have a lot of people pulling for you, you feel it. And the pitch. When he hit that ball, you heard the crack of it. And it's hit deep to left center. Andrew Jones on the run. This one has a chance. Home run. Mike Piazza and the Mets lead three to two. The place just absolutely erupted. My children, for the first time in 10 days, which I thought would never happen, were cheering and smiling and happy. And it was just, the, I'm getting the chills now just thinking of it. So there you have it. There's part two of the history of the New York Mets, 1987 to 2001. I'll be completing the series next week as we look into part three. As always, I want to thank you for watching. If you liked what you watched, please subscribe. Drop a comment. Maybe give me a little thumbs up. Cheers.